Hello everybody and welcome back to Fly From Home. I'm Kitty, I'm a real world commercial flying instructor and today I'm going to be giving you my own um, personal review of this thing, the uh, Just Flight PA28 Arrow 3 for Microsoft Flight Simulator. Right, okay, so first things first before we get into talking about uh, this aircraft in the simulator. I'm just going to give you a, a really quick rundown on the aeroplane in real life, just so you've got uh, something to go off if uh, you've never encountered this thing in the real world. So um, the Cherokee Arrow was first sort of incepted in uh, 1967. It uh, was basically intended as a better touring version of the everybody's favourite four-seat touring aeroplane, the PA-28. Cherokee. Um, they just added wobbly landing gear and a constant speed propeller and uh, hoped that it would prove good enough to make a good touring aeroplane. And unfortunately, it kind of didn't because they only gave it a uh, 180 horsepower engine, which was a, a bit crap, really. It didn't really offset the extra weight of the landing gear and the prop unit. Um, so the Arrow 1, as it was became known as, is not uh, an enormously popular aeroplane, certainly not with its original engine. In 1971, uh, Piper decided to attempt to fix these issues, so they stretched the fuselage slightly with a slightly longer nose, and they whacked a 200 horsepower engine in there. So the extra 20 horsepower was enough to give the aeroplane some quite nice performance, um, but it still only had quite small fuel tanks, uh, because it had the what's called the Hershey bar wing, the very short, stubby wing. Uh, so it had a fuel capacity of 48 gallons usable, which gave you round about four hours of endurance. So if you're going for a, a long distance cruising aeroplane that's supposed to be cruising all around the United States, four hours isn't going to get you that far. Um, so again, Piper went back to the drawing board and in 1976, they came out with this thing, the Arrow 3. Now, they added a much longer stretched out wing from the uh, Piper Warrior on here, and the fuel capacity went up to 72 gallons, which uh, gives you just about six hours of endurance in total. It also had the effect of improving a lot of the low speed handling characteristics of the aeroplane because the, the Arrow 2, with its little stubby wings, heavy aeroplane, high wing loading, um, on the upside, it was very stable, but on the downside, very poor glide performance and quite heavy, uh, sluggish handling at low air speeds coming into land, things like that. Bit of a brick, really. Um, so the Arrow 3 certainly rectified some of that. It's still a bit of a brick, um, <laughs> but, but a, a slightly more pleasant brick. The downside of the longer wings is that it suffered in terms of its cruising speed. So the Arrow 2 can get up to about 140 knots. The Arrow 3 usually sits down at about 130. But all in all, um, the Arrow 3 was a really big success. Um, there were a couple of other variants which came after that, but we don't talk about those. Get the Behind Me Satan Arrow 4. Um, so when Piper came back from the dead in the early 2000s and they decided to bring the Arrow back into production, they looked at all the different versions and they decided that this version, the Arrow 3, was the definitive version and this one is actually still on sale today. You can go out and buy yourself a brand new shiny Arrow 3. So that's the aeroplane in real life and where it's, uh, where it's sort of history lies. My history with this aeroplane, um, I have quite a lot of hours in this thing in real life. Uh, certainly over 300, although I've not exactly added up um, just how many I've got. It's the aeroplane that I teach commercial pilots licenses on here in the UK. Uh, it is the also, also the aeroplane which I completed my hour building for CPL in. Uh, it was the first sort of relatively fast, complex aeroplane that I, I learned how to fly. So I've got quite an emotional attachment to this aeroplane, I guess. So it's fair to say there's there's quite a lot of um, there's quite a lot riding on how good this aeroplane is for me. Uh, I've really been looking forward to to seeing this. I did own this um, a version of this aeroplane, I suppose you could say, for P3D prepared. Um, and I've got a couple of videos actually when I'm flying around in this thing in prepared on the channel. So definitely as soon as this came out for, my, for Microsoft Flight Simulator, it was a must buy for me. Uh, they gave me a 25% discount because I owned the P3D version, which was really appreciated. It means that I paid just over 20 British pounds for this thing. 
Um, and the point of this video today is going to be to find out, is this thing worth those 20 British pounds? Or 30 British pounds if you didn't buy the old version? Okay, so first things first, external model. Let's have a look at this thing in the hangar and see how it looks. So certainly from this sort of distance, it does look absolutely fantastic. It's a very easily recognizable shape and you can, for anyone who's familiar with the real aeroplane, you can tell they've got the proportions absolutely bang on with this thing. They've gone to a huge amount of effort, I think, um, of modeling this aircraft accurately. In fact, when I say this aircraft, I mean literally this aircraft, Golf Bravo Golf Kilo Uniform, uh, because they've gone out and they've done some extensive work with this exact aeroplane in real life to bring it to the simulator um, as accurately as possible. So this color scheme, these internals, uh, the equipment fit, all that kind of stuff is based on a real arrow. Um, so what you're not getting here is is kind of what the, the flight simulator default aeroplanes are, which is very shiny, box fresh, new models, and kind of a little bit less so, but similar with the Carinado aeroplanes. Um, which come out very, very shiny and clean uh, with a little bit of wear on that. This is an aeroplane which is, has lived its life um, <laughs> and has been knocking around uh, the skies since the, uh, since the early 70s. So this is a, or rather late 70s. So this is a, um, a, bit, a bit of a change really in terms of Microsoft Flight Simulator aeroplanes. Usually we get nice shiny things. Certainly an effort has been made with this aeroplane to make it look lived in. Um, and used. So you can see that the reflections aren't quite as bright and shiny. Um, there's lots of weathering and wear and dirt. Um, and when we go inside, you'll see even more of that. So the effort was, the aim was anyway, I think, to make uh, the aeroplane look real, to look like a, a real aeroplane that you might walk up to on the apron at any uh, flying school in the UK or in the US or anywhere, really, and jump in and go for a flying lesson in. So props for that. I like that approach. Uh, I think it looks cool. It's nice to have something a little bit different in the simulator. Um, now, that said, are the textures and reflections and blah 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 as good as the default aeroplanes and the Carinado aeroplanes that have come before? Um, now, I might get a bit of flack for this, but personally, I don't quite think it's as good some of the, the textures are a little bit blurry. You look at the warning around the gas escalator valve here. A um, little bit on the blurry side. Uh, once we go inside, I can kind of zoom in on the wing rivets for you and, and show that they're just a, a little bit little bit less high fidelity than certainly the, the, uh, the defaults in the Carinado are. Does that mean it's an ugly aeroplane externally? God, no, absolutely not. It, it looks fantastic. And certainly when you're in the simulator and flying around, you're not going to be zooming into to pixel level uh, on the wing uh, surfaces and, and judging, the, um, judging the textures. But overall, uh, I'd say the external model is excellent. It's got a nice bit of weathering on it, but it's not quite as good as some of the other aeroplanes out there. Right, before we go inside and have a look at the internal textures, um, we're just going to have a quick look at the liveries. We've got a lot of liveries on offer here, so I'm just going to quickly scroll through them all. All of them based on uh, real aeroplanes, and all of them are uh, fairly old looking or original Piper looking uh, liveries. So recognize that one if uh, you've got the Seminole from Carinado. I think there's a similar color scheme on there. This is a nice one, dark blue. Sea reg, I think that's Canada. Got a US reg one here. In that kind of matte grey, which is always nice to see a contrast between the gloss and the matte. Pretty cool. No idea what Hotel Bravo reg is. Possibly Swiss, going on the flag. Looks nice. Red. The uh, arrow logo on there. Victor Hotel Reg, no idea on that one as well. <laughs> Terrible world knowledge. Um, very, uh, very old-fashioned looking colour scheme. This nice though, nice clean and clean and simple. Delta registration, that's German. Nice dark blue. 
Uh, Teb's an aeroplane uh, with a bit of a personal connection to me because I've I've actually flown it in real life, which is a bit of a weird uh, a weird feeling to see something you've flown in real life in flight simulator. Another nice dark blue color scheme. Another UK aircraft, Golf Alpha. This is probably the most modern looking color scheme. Another November Reg US aircraft. Um, very nice dark blue bottom and some swooshy lines, which is always nice. Uh, and finally, there's a, there's a custom one here. The, the aircraft does come with a paint kit. So presumably, if you've got the prerequisite um, artistry skills, you can make your own color schemes for this thing, which is uh, really cool. Right, let's uh, let's take it inside. Right, here we are in the cockpit of the Arrow, here in our lovely shiny reflective hangar. And it's not really doing it much justice, in my opinion, because the sun's in our eyes. There we go, but that panel is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I did slate the textures of the, the externals very, very slightly a second ago, but you really can't pull the panel up. It is very, very good. Um, as you can see, that theme of an aeroplane which has been um, lived in, as it were, is continuing on the inside. Presumably this is the exact interior um, that Just Flight's study aeroplane has. Uh, so we've got these um, very 70s velour red uh, seats that look um, certainly very lived in. Look uh, pretty comfy though. I wouldn't mind sitting in uh, these for a few hours. Bit of grass and dirt on the the floor, which is uh, inevitable in every flying school aeroplane. You certainly don't carry a dust devil around with you to clean the inside of the plane out, so it tends to look a bit scruffy. Um, now, the actual uh, the yokes, I've the default for these is even more weathered than than this. You can actually it actually has all of the paint missing on one side of the uh, the yoke. I'll just flash a picture of that now up for you. Um, presumably, this is what uh, that real uh, aeroplane that they studied looks like. It's a it's a bit much for me personally. So uh, they actually have included a slightly less weathered internal textures package that you just swap out some files. It's very easy, and you can have slightly less internal weathering if uh, that's more your cup of tea. So that's what I've done to uh, jazz the aeroplane up a little bit inside and make it a little bit uh, cleaner. Uh, you can see this is what I was talking about about the uh, the sort of wing textures. You can see they're a little bit blurry. Uh, there's a couple of textures inside as well which are a bit blurry. Certainly, like that one there isn't uh, enormously HD, but certainly all of this stuff is absolutely lovely. You can see the instrument fit in this aircraft is capable but not cutting edge. So all of you fans of steam gauges, rejoice, because it's another steam gauge aeroplane in uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. Uh, you have the option of changing out this uh, slaved HSI, which is slaved to the magnetic compass up there, uh, to a traditional um, gyro, obviously this is gyro too, but a traditional DI, which is not slaved, which you have to keep lining up yourself if uh, that's your more your kind of cup of tea, if you want to do things really old school. I like the HSI though, it's more of a sort of IFR fit. Uh, you can see we've got the, the default Garmin 530 in here, um, the Microsoft Flight Simulator uh, 530. There's also options to fit the 430, again, default Microsoft. And there's also a custom uh, GPS 100, which we'll have a look when we're, we're actually loaded into the sim. Uh, it's a very old, not particularly capable unit, um, and they haven't modelled all of the features, but it is really nice to see that they've gone to the effort of putting uh, a properly custom GPS unit in this aeroplane. Transponder, DME, ADF, radios, all of these things are all custom made. They all work. Every switch in here does something. Uh, the circuit breakers pop, the alternate air works, everything in here works. So if there's a switch in here, you can click it and it will do something. And that is really really cool in my opinion uh, I think it's uh, the first time we've got a light aircraft certainly with that level of fidelity in this simulator and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about just how many features are included in this thing uh, a little bit later on because it, it is really a feature packed aeroplane so anyway that's the the inside uh, have a quick look at the back it's got the it's got the little curtains there if your passengers want a nap 
baggage compartment. Very, very similar to the Seminole back here. So if you watch my Seminole review, I said, oh, it's basically an arrow. Well, here's the arrow for comparison. So yeah, here's the interior. Uh, we've got, oh, we've got this big uh, iPad thing mounted here as well. This is for controlling some of the external elements and also for uh, things like changing your oil, believe it or not. Uh, this airplane actually saves the state of the aircraft after each flight, so not only where you left all the switches on the panel, but also how much wear and tear you're putting on the airplane as you fly it around. Um, so you eventually have to change the oil or the engine starts dropping power. I mean, top marks. There's obviously a, a real amount of effort that's gone into to making this thing. Uh, you can get rid of this thing with um, the intercom switch here, so you can flick that and it, it goes away, which is my personal preference because one of my pet hates is iPads sitting in line of view of uh, the pilot, so potentially there could be an aeroplane flying towards you that's been blocked out by, by this thing. I know it's a, it's a bit of a, a long shot, but it could happen, and uh, completely removing that possibility is um, is certainly better than being hit by another aeroplane, in my opinion, so um, <laughs> I always get rid of that in flight. But on the ground, I can show you all the, the stuff that, uh, that that thing does, so without further ado, let's load into the sim and have a look. Okay, so here we are in the sim with the Arrow all loaded up and ready to go. We're fueled up, we've got one pilot on board of 75 kilos, we've got a full load of fuel, so we've got just over uh, 1,000 kilos on our takeoff weight, uh, which is about 200 kilos under the aircraft's maximum takeoff weight. I've run all the performance figures, so I know what sort of numbers we should be getting on the climb outs. Uh, and what we should be able to achieve on the cruise. So we're going to really put this aeroplane through its paces and see how accurate it really is. We're here on the ground at Doncaster. We've got default, uh, standard ISA, um, temperature, pressure, no weather. So there's nothing to, uh, to interfere with our flight test. A um, few things before we kind of get in there and start running through the checklist. We've got a few little external elements here. Uh, that they've included, pretty much like the uh, Carinado aeroplanes. You've got some tie downs, you've got some nice little wheel chocks there, and you've got uh, the good old tow bar. So, looking good. As, is, uh, as I said uh, in the hangar view, the aeroplane looks much nicer in the sim uh, than it does in the hangar anyway. Um, it certainly looks nicer at this sort of zoom level. It looks very, very good. You certainly won't notice those slightly blurry textures. Right, so we we'll pop inside. Now our electronic flight bag thing is uh, all set up and you can see the external equipment here on this section. So we're going to get rid of all of those. As you can see you can open and close all of the uh, the various doors, that all works. You can pop the oil filler cap open which uh, is, is just a, a, a really sort of startling level of realism really, it's, it's really good. Um, close that up again. So you can see the maintenance panel here, so you can refill your oil, you can recharge your battery. There's various uh, warnings here which tell you if anything's failed, but we're all, um, we're all good as far as I can see. I'm not entirely sure that's for though. Co-pilot, we can get somebody to come and sit next to us, and their weight will automatic automatically be added to the aircraft weight and balance in the game. So they're not just an external model, they actually are sat there with you. Uh, but we want to do this flight test on our own, so we'll get rid of him. Um, you can see a bunch of different options up here. So you can automatically set the aeroplane up as ready for takeoff, ready for start, cold and dark. Um, there's an auto fuel selector option here. So one of the features of the arrow is that it only draws from one tank uh, at a time. So you've got to manage your fuel tanks. If you don't want to do that, if you just want to switch your brain off and cruise along, you can turn this on and it will manage your fuel for you and keep it uh, nice and balanced. You can switch through the different GPS units, so you can see now we've got the, the Garmin GPS 100 loaded in here now, and the ancient um, <laughs> radio sets, uh, just so I can show you what that thing can do and what it can't do. Uh, we're probably going to switch back to the 530 before we take off. State saving is turned on, so that is uh, a function which saves all your switch positions and the condition of the aeroplane when you stop flying it, so I've got that turned on, because I think it's pretty cool. Uh, HSI, we've got the HSI instead of the DI, so this thing, the slaved HSI, uh, if we put it over to DI, that's what the DI looks like, everyone's favourite, not. 
Certainly not what you want on a CPL sortie. So we'll go back to HSI. Uh, right. So all the doors closed. Equipment's removed. Now I'm going to be using my own company's checklists to get this thing started. Um, the aircraft does come with some absolutely brilliant documentation. It actually comes with the majority of the performance. In fact, I think it's all the performance graphs and tables from the Real Life Aircraft's Pilot's Operating Handbook, which is really good. It's almost like they're daring you to, to run the numbers and make sure their aeroplane stacks up to what it should be doing in real life. So I shall certainly be doing that. Uh, but really appreciate that they've included all that stuff. Usually I'm, I'm just having to go out and Google these things and, and get PDF copies or try to hunt down for the ones that belong to, to my own company. Um, so it's uh, it's really nice that they've included all that stuff as standard for you uh, in here. There is a, a very good checklist, very in-depth checklist, including a walk around and all sorts of stuff including included in that documentation. Uh, but I just think find it easier because I'm more familiar with our company's checklist. Um, I'm just going to be using that. In terms of the power settings and things that I'll be using, I'll be using the book suggested power figures, which... Um, you can fly this aeroplane in what's called over square so you fly with the manifold pressure higher than the rpm which is something that a lot of schools will say just don't do it um, normally for, for training operations our school is exactly the same we don't surpass the the rpm with the manifold pressure just to, to try to avoid situations which could over torque the the engine and, and cause all sorts of premature wear uh, but in order to get our book figures that we're aiming for today we're going to be running on the book um, power settings so you'll see me using some power settings, which uh, perhaps I wouldn't quite be using, certainly on a training sortie. Right, okay, that's out of the way. Let's uh, let's crack on with our internal checks then. So the parking brake is set. Door is closed. Passenger safety brief, well, we're on our own today. Seats and belts, so we're all uh, belted up and ready to go. Flight controls, let's do a quick round the box. And it's all full and free. Flaps. So we can check our flap function, manual flap lever here, uh, just like uh, the seminal. So we've got three stages. There's first stage, and we check the flaps come down. There's the second, and there's the third. And we check it uh, goes back up in stages as well, all the way back to fully retracted. So flaps are checked. Trim times two, so we check that our trimmers, and I'm in real life, I'd wind this all the way forward and all the way backwards to make sure I'd got full travel. I'm not going to bother because it takes ages. Uh, rudder trim, I'll just check that the little um, bit in the middle there is lined up in the middle. Shouldn't really need that. I've got no idea why um, single engine aircraft would need rudder trim, but uh, <laughs> maybe somebody can tell me in the comments. Um, trim's checked. Alternate static source. So this, again, is something that actually works on this aeroplane. We've got an alternate static source. It lives underneath the panel here. Um, so presumably you need to get right down there uh, to click it. Uh, or do you have to click here or something? It is supposed to work, but maybe this is just me being dumb. Uh, it's It sits underneath the panel on the real aircraft. Maybe you have to do some contortion with your uh, with your viewpoint to be able to actually get to that. But uh, suffice to say, it is supposed to be modelled. It certainly says it in the aircraft documents. Uh, gear lever check down, and we do have it down. Lights, so we'll put the uh, navigation lights on now. So the navigation lights are controlled by this little rotating thing here called a rear stat. It also puts all the radio lights on as well. So we don't want all our radio lights on draining our battery, so we make sure we just turn it past the click. And the click means our nav lights are on, but the radio lights should still be off. Uh, master and alternator switch. Uh, I'm just going to move the prop out of the way. Slightly awkward viewpoint in this aeroplane. Get the master on. We can hear the gyros running up. The fuel gauges are now giving us a nice accurate indica indication of our fuel level, which is full. Um, annunciator and low volts light should be on. There's our annunciator. Low volts hasn't quite come to life yet, but once the battery starts draining, that should pop up. Um, circuit breakers. I'll check all our circuit breakers. They are all in. Now, this is one of the amazing features of this aeroplane. You can pop individual circuit breakers as required if you want to fail a particular system. That is <laughs> really good, in my opinion. Um, landing gear lights. So we have three greens. We also have the orange light, which indicates the automatic gear extension system has been inhibited. 
So we are going to fly with the auto gear extension inhibitor because otherwise it's going to flop down when we're doing stalls and all sorts of things like that. I usually don't, well, I never usually fly with it working, but I will turn it on and show you that it does actually work. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this system, a little bit of history about the aeroplane. Um, Piper added an automatic system that puts the gear down if you idle throttle below 87 knots to stop you doing gear up landings. Uh, and it was originally intended to obviously stop people doing gear up landings and also to, to reduce the insurance, the cost to insure the aircraft in the US when it first came out. So they were hoping to, to get a lot of people on board uh, who would normally be prohibited from owning a complex retractable gear aeroplane by dropping the insurance prices down, which is a great idea. But um, there are some real downsides to the system. So potentially imagine if you are wanting to emergency land on water, you always emergency land on water with your gear up, otherwise it's got a tendency to flip the aeroplane upside down. Well, you can't do that if you've got the emergency gear extension system active. Uh, perhaps you're trying to stretch a glide. Bear in mind the aircraft's glide speed is 80 knots. Um, so if you're gliding along, you don't really want your gear to pop down because otherwise it's going to heavily affect your glide performance. Um, at least, you know, you sort of tend to delay the gear until you're absolutely confident you can make your, your landing site. Um, so there were a few accidents actually, certainly in the US, caused by this system. So most people have, have had this um, this permanently inhibited. Some aircraft it does still work. Uh, a couple of the aircraft at my company it does still work, but I always make sure it's, it's deactivated. And you can tell it's deactivated when that yellow light is on there. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, turn coordinator, flag out, we can hear it running, so the little doll's eye flag is out, we can hear the gyro. ATIS, uh, we're not going to pick that up, we know the weather's perfect. Radios are all off. Taco and Hobbs, so we do have an actual uh, Hobbs meter, which spins around and shows us how many hours we've been flying this aeroplane around, which is uh, very cool. Fuel selector, set to the lowest tank, they're both the same, we'll leave it where it is. Our fuel selector, by the way, is down here. Uh, throttle, full and free and set half an inch open. Prop, full and free, set full fine. Mixture, full and free, set idle cutoff. So this is a fuel injected aeroplane, so we start with the mixture in the idle cut position. Alternate air, full and free, and set closed. Fuel pump, electric fuel pump on. Cabin heats, check the cabin heats controls are both set to off there. We're going to prime the aircraft because it's its first flight of the day. So we're just going to pull the fuel flow lever forward until we get fuel flow for about four seconds and then stick it back to idle. So pressure goes up. One, two, three, four. Back to idle again. Check the air is clear all around, which it is. No virtual people to mince. Uh, shout clear prop. Yeah, max to both. Do that on my honeycomb switch. Right, let's see if we can get this thing started. Okay, starter warning light is out. Oil pressure is in the green RPM 1200 there on memory items for after starting. So you notice as I was cranking the engine, as soon as it started, I threw the fuel flow forward uh, to keep the engine running. So that's uh, usually how you start a fuel-injected aeroplane. Okay, so there's no fire. We've checked the uh, T's and P's and the warning light. Brakes are holding. Fuel pump can now go off. We can now pop on our avionics. So I'll just show you these really old-fashioned radios. Now, these would actually not be allowed uh, in the UK because they're only 722 spacing. Um, or is it 760? It, it's it's the, <laughs> the smaller of the two spacings. Um, therefore, they're not actually allowed um, in the UK in most places because most places are, are on 833 now. So we'll pop them on. I'll show you what they're like, but I'm going to change it to the 530 for um, slightly better realism. I'll put the transponder to standby, and we'll fire this thing up so I can show you what it looks like. It's going to run through a bit test. Uh, yeah, as to the database is okay. It's going to acquire some satellites, and then it'll it'll pop up. Now, this works if you set a route in the Microsoft Flight Simulator 
menu screen. You can give yourself a route, it will show you that route, it will give you distance to run track, blah, 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 all the rest of it. However, uh, it doesn't allow you to input direct twos and things like that. So that functionality isn't quite there. I don't know if they're planning to bring that functionality to this aeroplane as time goes on. I hope so, because it would be really cool. Uh, in fact, let's put our beacon light on now we're running. Um, <laughs> It would be really cool if they did that, but for now, um, all you can really do with this, unless you've got a route uh, preset in it, is, as you can see, route's empty. You can look at the um, nearest airports, BORs, NDVs. Uh, it will give you the distance and, I guess, um, track to them. Um, and that's about it. Uh, you can't actually put anything in on those pages. So. It's nice to have, it's interesting to have. Uh, it's a very old fashioned unit, so it's not all that common to see those sorts of things, certainly in Flight Simulator. But we're going to get rid of it. Uh, there's the 430. As you can see, there's a bit of a blanking panel in there. Uh, it's got the 530 in there, so it fills the panel up nicely. We've actually got our 833 spacing now. Uh, we can set our comm radios. That we can Done. do that, and we can check all of our nav equipment actually works as we would in the real aeroplane. So, what I've done there is I've tuned the Doncaster ILS on 1095. Uh, Comrades, I've just set up to Doncaster Tower and Radar. Uh, the DME is slaved to NAV1. You can manually tune that if you want, um, but it's automatically slaved in there, so it will give us the distance to the uh, India Foxtrot November Lima, which is the Doncaster ILS. That's my Facebook. Shut up. Okay, I have to turn that off now. Um, <laughs> I always forget to do that. Um, transponder is very old-fashioned type with the individual rotating numbers uh, got to be careful with this so it's very easy to, to accidentally set it to one of the the, the no no codes the seven uh, seven 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 six seven five uh, so we'll uh, leave it on in fact we'll, let's, let's put a Doncaster squawk in here just for the avoidance of doubt a bit of extra realism we've got common nav 2 so we uh, change the frequencies on this one using those two knobs there. We've got it set to voice. We can set it, set it to ident there, and we can listen to uh, the ident. We've got a, a visual ident for nav 1, so we don't need to listen to the audio for nav 2. We can do that. Turn the volume up. And hopefully it's going to give us an ident. It certainly isn't at that frequency. There we go. Okay, cool. Turn that back off again. Uh, DME, you'd also have to wind in that one as well, um, which you can do with this switch. Uh, but it all works. You have to trust me on this one. I'm not going to go through it all. Um, ADF, we've got that one pointing at the Doncaster Foxtrot November Yankee Beacon. Now, this is one of the few things that I've found which doesn't really work as it should do. When you switch to antenna mode here, antenna setting, this should swing around and park on the right-hand wing. It doesn't at the moment. I don't know if they're going to fix it or not, but right now uh, it doesn't actually work. BFO is is beat frequency oscillator, which is a really fancy way of saying it makes a loud no noise, like a tone noise, that you can use to tune stations in. Uh, also works, but we're going to leave it on ADF, because that's the actually useful function. And we can turn the volume up and listen to the identifier, the Foxtron of MB Yankee, on there. Okay, so that's all our uh, radios set and checked. Okay, let's carry on with our checklist. Um, we've got avionics are all uh, now on and set up. An oscillator and low voltage light. Uh, I've actually got the low voltage light on, but that's normal at this sort of RPM. Uh, an oscillator panel is now clear, and we can push to test and make sure the lights are all working. Our meter should be charging, so we are getting a charge, and we can double check that uh, with our pitot heat. And it spikes up a little bit comes down when you turn it off. Suction should be three to five inches and the suction on these airplanes is always in a different place. It's over here on this one. It's actually quite a good place in this one. So it should be three to five. It's uh, just over four, about four and a half. 
so that's good. Uh, magnetos, so drop no stop on the mags. I think I might have turned it off there. <laughs> I packed a bow. Bit of a dead cut, never mind. Yeah, that's fine. Flight instruments, so uh, airspeed. A little scale is working here, and it's set. Bars are set in the middle on the attitude. Uh, we're going to set standard on the primary altimeter. That's fine, leave it on zero. And the uh, compass card on here is working. Balls in the middle, flags out, wings are level. Uh, that's agreeing with that. We'll set uh, runway heading. We're going to use runway 20. Here and on there, and no climb or descent indicated, and the glass isn't broken. And also, we've got our backup altimeter over here, so we'll set it to 1013. It's kind of hidden behind this thing, which is one of the reasons why I don't like to fly around with this thing uh, still visible. In fact, we're pretty much done with this now, so I'm going to flick this little switch here, which gets rid of it. And there, there we go, it's much better. Okay. So, flight instruments are all uh, checked and set. Common now radio set. Flight plan we don't have. Transponder, we don't have a flight idea or anything like that to input. Uh, taxi clearance, we don't need. Landing light as required. It's not night time zero. We don't need that. So, let's go. I'm going to idle the throttle. Get our seat back in the right position. Release the parking brake. And off we go. Okay, so our taxi is pretty much finished. We're coming up to the holding point here. We're just going to do some power checks to check that the uh, aircraft systems respond as they should do. Uh, one of the things you might have noticed is the sound of this aeroplane. Um, it is uncannily good. It is extremely accurate to what the real aeroplane sounds like. Certainly outside, really nice sort of bassy noise that this aeroplane makes certainly compared to uh, other four-cylinder light aircraft, so very, very nice indeed. Right, so our taxi checks have, uh, were completed as I was taxiing out there. So we checked all our instruments and our rudder travel. Um, so now we are ready to crack on with our power checks. So parking brake is set, temperatures and pressures, let's see, we've now got oil temperature indicating, which is perfect. Um, Fuel selector. We are going to change tanks to make sure both sides work. Uh, on the ground, you don't need to use the fuel pump to, to change it over. Mixture check full rich, which we have. Prop full fine. Cover the brakes. Check clear behind. Throttle up to 2000 RPM. You see the airplane wobbling around under the slipstream. Uh, the power of the, the engine and the propeller, really realistic there. Temperatures and pressures check in limits again, yeah, everything looks nice and healthy. Got a charge on the amps, oil temperatures and pressures are in the green. Suction 4.85.1, uh, around 4.8 there, so that's perfect. Alternate air, no drop, so let's uh, move over so we can actually move it properly. There's no RPM change or manifold pressure change when we move that around. Magnetos, check drop 175 RPM max. So keep an eye on the RPM indicators. Now you've got a left mag, then both, then right mag, then back to both. Very slight drop, so obviously the mags on this airplane in very good condition. Uh, propeller exercise. Let's do our prop exercise. So the first one, we're looking for a rise in manifold pressure, drop in RPM. So you may not have seen that, it was a little bit far away. I'll just do it again. There is a rise in manifold pressure and a drop in RPM. Perfect. Let's look over the top, looking for any leaking oil coming out of the prop governor. There we go. Nothing seen there. And the final one we're going to do is we're going to check that the oil pressure fluctuates, indicating that there's oil moving through the governor. 
perfect, there we go. And it's back up to its normal position. So that's the pro propeller exercised. Now we check the prop at idle, should be between five and 800 RPM. Little bit high, 1000 RPM, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt on that one. And we'll go up to, back up to 1200 RPM, which is our ground idle setting. Fuel pump is going to come on at this point. Throttle friction is fine. Mixture set full rich. Prop is fine. T's and P's are in limited in limit. Fuel content sufficient to note. We've got six hours of fuel on board, minus 30 minutes uh, for a safety margin. So we've got five and a half, which is more than we need. Um, and while I remember, I'm going to make sure our little stopwatch is ready to go, and hopefully I'll remember to turn that on when we pull onto the runway. Right, before departure checks, don't need a departure clearance, the nav radios are all set and checked. Pointers and bugs, we've got runway heading bugged up there. Uh, HSI is aligned with the compass, we'll double check that, yes it is. Uh, altimeters set and cross checked, so we've got 1013 set times two, they're both agreeing with it and within 50 feet of airfield elevation, which is 50 feet. Transponder code, got a Doncaster Squawk on there, standby, all tested. Com radio is tuned, Com 1 is active, so we've got Com 1 set on the selector up there. Uh, map uh, is fine, the range is good. Trim times 2, set for departure, so we just check we've got neutral indicated there, which we have, and we've got uh, the little indicator in the middle there, all checked. Uh, flaps as required, we don't need it, it's uh, standard takeoff, not for short fields, so we're not going to deploy any flap. Controls full and free, uh, let's do a full and free check, so let's go outside. Full back, full forward, full right, full left, and back to the middle. So our controls are full and free and moving in the correct sense. Door is latched and the locks are in times two. Both of these things do work and you can open the door by pressing on the, uh, the little armrest there. So it's very good. Uh, seats and belts are secure. Departure brief. Don't need a departure brief. Huds and goggles don't have. Annunciations are all clear. Nothing on the GPS. So we are ready to roll. Right, so quick note on the performance of the aeroplane. At our current weight, and for these currently at current atmospheric conditions, we should be getting in the vicinity of 800 feet per minute and a full power full RPM climb. So that's 2700 RPM throttle all the way forward. Now we aren't going to climb with that power setting all the way up to our cruise. We'll go up to about 3000 feet. We're going to pull it back to 25 inches and 2500 RPM. Um, or in fact, no, we're going to go for 26 inches and 2500 RPM because we're going to be using the, uh, the book figures. Uh, but initially we're going to look, be looking for around 800 feet. Now it may be a little bit on the low side because book figures are always adjusted slightly down to compensate for aircraft that are a bit worn. So don't be surprised if it's a little bit over that, but we're looking for something in that ballpark um, for the climb performance of the aeroplane. Cruise up at 3000 feet with 75% uh, best power set. We should be looking for a TAS of about 132, 133 knots. So indicated that's going to be about 130. So that's what we're looking for. So keep your eyes out for that. You're my co-pilots on this one. And uh, you can make your own judgment how close we get on the departure. So parking brakes off. Let's get ourselves lined up and get out of here. So some of the noises you can hear in the cabin, really good. Here the brakes make noises and, and all sorts of things, so really nice and immersive. So approach path, clear to left, clear to the right. Transponder is going on to altitude reporting. Pito heats on and all the lights on. We are ready to go. Last check of the T's and P's, all in the green. We're going to roll through here. Wind is light and variable. No need to deflect the controls. I'm going to hold the brakes a little bit and ramp the power up. Everything's still green, no warning lights, all checked. Brakes off, full power set. Look for 65 knots for the rotate. Nice acceleration, brilliant noise. There's 50. There's 60. There's 65. Back on the controls, really heavy like the real aeroplane. A lot of right rudder required to keep it heading straight. Look for 80 knots initially, climbing with deployed. We're going to keep the gear down. 
until we're at a safe altitude to retract it. Immediately onto the trim to help out with the, just how heavy the aeroplane's nose is. The electric trim switch and the little inhibitor underneath the yoke do work on this aeroplane. I'll tell you what I've forgotten. The timer, that's going now. <laughs> told you I forgot it. Right, passing 400 feet, we're almost across the end of the runway. That means it's time for gear up. So gear selected up. In transit light is on, the greens are out. Now without adjusting attitude too much, the aircraft should naturally accelerate to 90 knots, which is our VY speed with the gear up, which it is doing, lovely. Rate of climb is, let it settle down a bit. 800 feet per minute, look at that, beautiful. We're gonna climb down straight ahead. Between 800 and 1,000, so yeah. Well within limits. Passing 1,000 feet, backup fuel pump can go off, landing light can go off. We'll just climb straight ahead, up to a cruise, cruise altitude of 3,000 feet. I'm now going to back the power off to about 26 inches and pull the prop back to 2,500 RPM. that climb performance is still pretty much looking on the money. We have obviously pulled the power back a little bit now and we're climbing a touch so that's going to have an effect on it. Passing 2,000 feet, check the manifold pressure, still set correctly, T's and P's good. Quick look over the nose for any traffic, nothing seen, continue. Obviously as we increase our altitude and the air pressure drops, our manifold pressure will decrease. So that's why every thousand feet I always do a little check to make sure that we are still at our correct setting. Let's have a quick look outside. Look at that. Beauty. What a noise as well. Okay, coming up to our level of points. Gently relax the back pressure. Now as the aeroplane accelerates, it's going to, or I'm expecting it's going to need quite a lot of uh, forward trim. And the aeroplane should take up quite a nose down cruising attitude, which is something which is distinctive to the arrow. It's actually really helpful gives you a great view over the front. Okay, so our speed is looking good now. We've got our 2500 RPM, 26 inches of manifold pressure. In fact, we're going to feed a tiny bit more in there just to compensate for uh, that altitude. And I'm going to pull the fuel flow back to our 75% setting of 12 gallons an hour. So we're all set up for the cruise and we are making Pretty much 130 indicated, so bang on the money, absolutely perfect. And true to the real arrow, it's flying really stable. Controls feel quite heavy, but very nice, responsive. Just from the, the sort of perspective I know it's not something you can really measure but uh, as far as I'm concerned this is a, a, a great representation of how the real thing flies okay so we're all trimmed out we're happy with the cruise performance that's absolutely bang on the money so let's uh, start to look at some of the general handling now the the general handling characteristics of the arrow are very very benign the airplane stalls you barely even know it's stalled 
Uh, probably the, the, the main thing we'll be looking for on the stall is just a high rate of descent and a bit of buffeting. So what we're going to do, we're going to do a clean stall and an approach configuration stall. And we're just going to have a look at the aircraft, um, how, it, how it behaves in the stall um, and see if it matches up to the performance of the real world aeroplane in that sort of situation. So we'll do a quick hazel check, height sufficient, airframe is clean, safety and security that's all fine, engine, fuel pump on. How long we've been running on this tank for five minutes, that's fine, we'll leave it on this tank for now. Just check the alternate air, no change. Location, clear of active airfields, built up areas, controlled airspace, danger zones, well, I think we're probably still inside Doncaster's controlled airspace, but I'm sure they won't mind. Uh, danger zones, nothing like that around here. And lookout, so uh, normally I'd do a quick lookout turn, but I've got traffic turned off today, so I'll absolve myself of that responsibility. We will have a quick, good look around. So I'm going to pull the throttle back all the way to idle. I'm going to throw the fuel make the uh, fuel flow all the way back forward again. I'm going to idle the throttle. That's the gear warning hall you can hear. I'm going to put the prop back to pull forward, and I'm just going to pitch to maintain. I'm going to need quite a lot of nose-up trim initially to help uh, maintain this, just because of how heavy the aeroplane is. A little bit of left rudder coming in. I'm not going to add any more trim as we pass 80 knots though because otherwise it's going to make our recovery harder and I don't want that to happen. So there's the stall warner, there's a buffet and that's it. She's gone full back stick, high rate of descent, heavy buffet, honestly perfect. This is just how a real arrow stalls. I'm going to relax the back pressure, add full power. Very easily she drags herself out of the stall with all that power. A lot of right pedal required to keep the ball in the middle. Start to wash that uh, that trim off now. Get it trimmed back out for 90 knots. And we'll climb back up to 3,000 feet. Honestly, guys, that was um, about as good as you can get in Flight Simulator for a representation of the real aircraft. Absolutely bang on the money as far as I'm concerned. That's just what real arrows do. They almost never drop wings or anything violent like that. They're so well behaved almost to the point where they're too well behaved because you can't really demonstrate a lot of the stall characteristics that you want to for your student. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of the accuracy of this aeroplane, absolutely perfect. Right, give me a second to get it trimmed back out again and reconfigured, and we'll do the approach config stall. Okay, here we are, fully configured, gear down, full flat. I mean, to add quite a lot of power to compensate for all of that drag, it's uh, still a bit of a brick, despite that longer wing. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing. So the fuel flow is still full forward. I'm going to pull the power back. I'm going to throw the prop full forward. I'm going to use some trim to help me out here. But nothing below 70. Heavy buffer, rate of descent. She's gone. Relax the back pressure, full power right pedal, gently bring the nose up to avoid a secondary stall, attitude set, flaps two, gear up, positive climb, flaps one, accelerating to 90, rate of climbs increasing, flaps zero. Perfect. Again, bang on the money. Absolutely what I'd expect. Okay, so that's our stalling done. Uh, let's do a couple steep turns and then we'll uh, have a look at a few more things on the airplane. Okay, so we're now set up in uh, with 2200 RPM and 26 inches of manifold pressure. So this is that over square setting I was talking about earlier. Not something you generally do as uh, part of flight training, but it is in the book. So I'm just checking that the airplane gives us about 115 knots, and hey, look at that. 115 knots, bang on the money, absolutely perfect. So, I'm gonna let the prop go um, go forward again. I'm gonna go back up to 2500 RPM. Let the aircraft accelerate. Pull the manifold pressure back to about 22 inches. We're looking for about 120 knots. And we're gonna have a good look out the left-hand side of the aircraft. I'm gonna start our steep turns. So make sure everything's nice and tripped out. And we'll go in, so bank. 45 degrees balance with the pedals and back pressure and add power as required to maintain the uh, entry speed. Bit of back pressure required but the aeroplane is really nice and stable. 
so it's quite easy to keep this going. Just like the real aeroplane, really, the arrow too is quite tricky to steep to um, one of the functions of those little stubby wings, but the, uh, the three with that long wing, much easier. I'm going to add a little bit of power because we're losing about five knots now. Coming up to our turnout point, I'm going to anticipate, bank, oops, sorry about that, bit of violent on the pedals, balance and uh, back pressure, relax that back pressure off. So avoid going into a climb and then reset the power to where we had it before, so let's go back to 22 inches. Okay, perfect. As far as I'm concerned, that's uh, a pretty good representation of a steep turn in an arrow. Looking rather nice. So, uh, let's, uh, let's put a route in the GPS and we're going to head over to Nottingham and I'm going to see how the good old autopilot works in this aeroplane. Before I do that, it's almost time for a, a Frida check, so let's get that done now. So, fuel, pump is on, let's change tanks, pump off, pressure's good, pressure, sorry, is good, uh, radio is... Let's, uh, for the sake of realism, put it onto Nottingham. 134. 880. Uh, engine TCPs are fine. Let's uh, get the aircraft set back up again. 2500 RPM and 22 inches. That should give us about 120 knots. And bring the fuel flow back to 10 gallons an hour, which is our 65% power setting. And I'm going to put a route in the nav system, and then I'll get right back with you when we're on route to Nottingham. Okay, and we're back. I didn't want to bore you with uh, me just putting stuff in the 530. Uh, we're now slave to GPS, so our HSI is giving us GPS readout. That does actually work in this airplane, which is great. I'm just going to put the autopilot on into heading hold mode and just use the heading bug to steer the aeroplane all the way to Nottingham. Now I'm going to go heading mode on. We've got heading selected on the, the little selector here. I'm going to go autopilot on. And there we go. Now, the autopilot on this aeroplane, just like the autopilot uh, that's fitted to the real arrow most of the time, is only operational in one channel, which means it only controls the roll of the aircraft. It doesn't do anything to the pitch. So how well this aeroplane holds altitude is all down to how well you've got this aeroplane trimmed out. So as you can see, we're trimmed out quite nicely at the moment. So we're holding altitude. If I was to push the yoke, as you can see, I've still got full control of the pitch. The autopilot just has control of the roll. So a very, very simplistic autopilot. It's just there to take some of the, the workload away, but you certainly can't completely turn your brain off. Not that you can with an autopilot anyway. Um, but you certainly need to remain a little bit more switched on than you normally would when flying under autopilot with this particular one, just based on the fact that you're still in command of the uh, the pitch of the aeroplane. So everything's looking good, sounding good, smelling great. Um, we're on our way to Nottingham. We'll uh, we'll do a standard. To, well, we'll we'll join on to um, Crossman Lake for runway two seven, and uh, we'll fly a circuit. Buy a couple of circuits, put her on the ground, and then I'll give you my uh, my final impressions of the aeroplane. Okay, so uh, we're just passing Lamley Prison here, which means we've got about five miles to run. There we go, six miles. Um, until Nottingham, so we're going to start thinking about our descent. We're going to do our free mad check, which is our pre-join, so fuel pump is on. Radio is set to Nottingham. Mixture, we're going to go full rich now. Altimeter set airfield Q&H, everything's 1013, so that's fine. And DI, the HSI is still behaving itself, which is all good. Uh, about five miles to run, 2,000 feet to lose, so we should probably start our descent now. So I'm just going to back the power off. The airplane should kind of tip itself into a descent. I'm going to add a little bit of forward pressure. We're still under autopilot at the moment, so the airplane is flying itself to a degree. 
Middle Eastern heading. And I can control that with the heading bump. Just taking the aeroplane off to the right a little bit to aim us towards crosswind. Here's the National Water Sports Centre, and Nottingham Airfield is just there, off the uh, just slightly to the left of the nose. So runway 27 is obviously across us that way. I'm going to put the aircraft back into V-lock mode and set the CDI onto 270 degrees. So we've got a visual representation of our runway heading. Uh, normally I would put OBS mode on here and put a magenta line on there to show our runway heading as well. Uh, but sadly, Flight Sim doesn't quite have this uh, that feature just yet. I'd really like if they did add it. But that's no slight on just Flight as a developer because they didn't develop this, uh, this system. As I said in the, um, the video for the Seminole, Microsoft have said multiple times that they're working on bringing more functionality to these things. So hopefully it'll get better and better as the Sim matures. Looking good. I'm going to start bringing the speed back a little bit now. I'm also going to start resetting the prop to 2200 RPM for noise abatement procedures. The lower the RPM is, the less noise we make. And a lot of this circuit gets quite close to settlements. It's also a quite a low circuit. 800 feet above ground level, we'll find at 950 for 150 feet airfield elevation. That's wrong, the QNH. So what I am intending to do is one standard circuit, full flap approach, one flapless, and then one glide approach to land, and we'll see how well that one works out. Um, autopilot is going off now. I'm going to keep backing the power off, aiming for about 100 to 110 knots, just assuming that there's going to be circuit traffic knocking around here at Nottingham. There's a couple of flying schools based here. Um, there is a helicopter school base here, so there's usually quite a lot of slow circuit traffic. So we certainly don't want to be steaming in there at 120, 130 knots and ramming people up the butt, which is very, uh, very impolite in the world of aviation. Probably in the real world, too. Right. Good look at the left-hand side of the aircraft. I'm going to start turning onto downwind now. Wind's very light, so we don't really have to worry about... Uh, putting a wind correction in on any of our legs. Absolute easy mode today in the sim, just so we can get some nice baseline figures for the performance of the aeroplane, of course. Not because I'm a terrible pilot and can't deal with wind correction. Right. Heading up to the east now, let's do our pre-landing check. So brakes checked, pressurized undercarriage, speed check below 127 gear down. Mixture full rich. Max are on both. We're going to add some more power now. Go up to 26 inches with this RPM settings, which we have done to keep the aircraft at about 90 knots. Uh, fuel is on and sufficient. We're going to keep the tanks where they are for now. Flaps, speed check below 103, flaps 1. Coming up to our base leg position now. Instruments are all good. Car people don't have, but we got the alternate air, which we're just going to cycle very quickly, like that. Uh, Hatches harness is secure, landing light on, let's turn base leg. And start the aircraft coming down in a nice gentle descent now. Speed check, below 103 flaps 2. Onto base leg, look for about six to 700 feet. Uh, for the base to final turn. 90 knots is a good speed, happy with that. There's 600, I'm gonna roll into the turn now. Monitoring the speed very closely during this one. So it could be a real killer. Okay, we're gonna have a full flap now. Bring the power back, looking for about 80 knots, steering on the rudder. Okay, we're going to do our reds, blues, greens check. So reds full forward, blues full forward, three greens. Coming back.
going back to about 75 knots now, looking good. Back trim to help. Come on, centre line, where are you? Idle the throttle quite late just because of how heavy this aeroplane is. Not a bad touchdown, flaps up, full power. 65, and three. Bit odd. Have to accelerate to 80 now. Quick VX climb just to get us away from the ground as quickly as possible. Settlement right in front of us, and we need to make an early turn at about 300 feet. Get the gear up. Now the aircraft to accelerate to 90. It's going to be flat as approach this time around. Put the aircraft on crosswind towards Tolerton. knots we have, looking for that 950 feet circuit height, adjusting the trim as we go. Quick look out to the left to start the turn. Start bringing the power back a touch. 26 inches, 2500 RPM. down to about 20 inches and 2200 RPM again. And straight into our downwind check, so brakes are pressurised, undercarriage, speed check below 127 gear down. Mix is full rich, mags are on both, fuel is on sufficient flaps, in fact we're going to change the tanks. Uh, flaps not required, instruments are all good, car peak don't have, got this, I'd cycle it if it wasn't under the mixture lever. Agent's harness is secure and landing lights are still on. So I don't need to add quite as much power this time as the gear comes down to keep us at about 90 or 100 knots because uh, we haven't got the extra drag from the first stage of flaps. You'll find you need quite a lot of power in this aeroplane once the flaps and gear are deployed. That's absolutely like the real aeroplane. It's very draggy. Uh, you keep the power on until the last minute when you touch down. So pretty much in the flare is when you cut the power. So it's almost like a, a larger commercial aircraft in that sense. Power stays on until sort of the last minute. I'm just going to manage my speed a little bit here because we're a touch fast base leg. Uh, touch low as well, so let's get that sorted out. Trade some of that speed for altitude. Start the turn on to final. For about 85 initially. Get that nose up trim in. I'm going to have to hike my seat up slightly higher because uh, that the attitude on a flaps approach is much higher. So just to keep track of the runway. Reds, blues, greens. Come back to 75 as we approach the tarmac. Rudder inputs. Oh, not my best. Just got a little bit slow, that. But pretty accurate to what the real aeroplane would do to you if you uh, messed up like that. 65, and up we go again. Could have done with a bit more uh, nose-up trim, actually, to help me there. Okay, let's climb VX for a little bit. Get away from the ground, there's 300 feet, allow the aircraft to start accelerating towards VY, gear up. So this time I'm going to do a, a glide approach. I'm going to do it from, uh, I'll be kind to myself, I'll do it from base leg. Some examiners will uh, get you to do it from the end of downwind. If they're feeling particularly unkind, let's get the power set. 26 inches. 2500 RPM, start sending on to downwinds. And because it's a glide.
modified approach, I'm going to do my checks slightly differently as we get up to our desired altitude here. So brakes pressurised, undercarriage defer, mixture small rich, fuel on and sufficient, flaps defer, instruments are all good, car feet don't have, hatches and harness are secure, landing light is on, checks complete. Let's get levelled out here. Let's bring that power, that prop back to 2200, power back to about uh, 18 or 19 inches. So I'm going to start my base leg slightly earlier, but a little bit of extra height. Uh, it's only going to help matters, so I'm not going to try to get rid of that. Fingers crossed. Right, idle and set the glide, 80 knots. 80 we have, trim it out. Look at the runway. What do we think? Are we going to make it? Yes, we are. Gear down. Touch fast. Put a nose up trim. Let's start getting some flap in. Flaps one. Flaps two. Full flap. Reds, blues, greens. And here we go. Express elevator to hell. This is just like the real thing. Um, very, very high rate of descent. And then the, the skill is all going to be about when we pull the flare. We're going to go here. Get on those rudder pedals. Where's the center line? I've done worse. Okay, we're in one piece. Yeah, quite a tricky aeroplane to fly at low speed close to the ground, which is really the, the weak spot of the real arrow, which is, you know, I can't really pull them up on that. It's, uh, it's bang on. My own uh, crappy flying let me down, certainly on the flapless approach. Okay, runway vacated. Let's uh, put the park brake on, RPM 1200, and do our after landing checks. So check our trim is neutral, flaps up, fuel pump off, landing light off. Wingtip strobes off, Peter heat off, transponder goes to standby. And uh, let's park up and then let's have a chat about uh, where this aeroplane sits in terms of uh, my opinions. Okay, so conclusion time. Um, do I think it's worth it? So I'm going to do my usual positives and negatives. Uh, then I'll do my conclusion and then I'll just let you make up your own mind. Because uh, if we're all sheep and you all follow what I say, then uh, it would be a very interesting world with it. So, positives. The first one I've got on here is the big one, in my opinion. Um, the flight model. I think the flight model is just about the most accurate light aircraft I have experienced in Microsoft Flight Simulator. I don't think there's anything really that comes as close to being as book accurate as this thing is. There's obviously been a huge amount of effort done with the, the new aerodynamic system in this simulator to make it handle as closely to the numbers uh, of the real one as possible and also the the overall sort of feel of it the amount of uh, control application required to achieve maneuvers to pull it off the runway to get into a steep turn the amount of back pressure it requires to maintain altitude in the steep turn in the flare how hard you've got to pull on the yoke i mean that, that is all stuff that you have to do in in the real airplane um, bear in mind i'm using a honeycomb yoke which might make things a little bit more um, realistic for me in my head kind of thing I don't know it's all kind of subjective I guess but certainly for my setup um, the aeroplane feels so so close to the real thing it's quite uncanny so top marks 10 out of 10 5 out of 5 3 yarn balls out of 3 I don't know whatever metric you want to use it is um, the flight model is is in my opinion excellent um, the next thing that I would praise it for is the quality of the exterior and interior model. Uh, it is very, very true to the real-life aeroplane. All of the, the little fasteners and nuts and bolts and rivets are all exactly where they are in the real plane. Um, it looks absolutely bang on the money uh, in terms of how the, the shape of the real aeroplane, how it sits on the ground, how it looks when it's flying. Um, Oh, that's another thing, the attitude of the aeroplane in, in the cruise is, is bang on the money as well, the, the way it sits in the cruise in terms of going back to the flight model again. 
so yeah, uh, outside and of course inside, certainly the panel. The panel looks so good. I believe it's uh, like a 4K textures that they've done with this thing. Um, it looks really, really nice. Um, the next sort of thing I've put on there, I've got the sound model of the aeroplane. So the engine sounds uncannily accurate. It's obviously been recorded from a real aeroplane, a real Arrow uh, 3. The sound both inside and outside is really good. It's nice and bassy. Um, go outside as you're flying along, you've got that, that sort of bassy roar from the engine on the ground when you're taxiing, when you're taking off. It's really nice. It adds to the, the immersion. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big sucker for, for loud engine noises, so I think it sounds great. It's, they've done a really great job with that. Going back to the panel, um, I've got, um, as my next point, the panel and the instrumentation. Um, it looks uh, it looks great, but also it works great. Everything on here works. Everything's clickable. Everything actually does something. It's not just clickable and, and nothing happens. It actually has a function in the aeroplane. It's, it's brilliant. Um, one of the things I didn't actually show you, but the, the emergency gear extension does work. Uh, the automatic extension, if you move this into the automatic position so the orange light goes out, um, slow down below 87 knots with the throttle at idle, it will drop the gear out for you. All of that stuff works. All the different autopilot modes um, with a little caveat, which I will get onto later. Um, all of this sort of stuff. So the amount of effort that's gone into modeling this, this panel and the instrumentation and um, all of the radios and stuff is absolutely top notch. Um, Moving on from there, sort of similar sort of vein, the depth of the fun functionality in this aeroplane is is just a, a level above. Um, my mags are still on. A uh, level above anything else in Microsoft Flight Simulator, in, certainly in terms of light aircraft right now. Uh, the fact that you've got um, oil usage, you've got spark plug fouling, you've got vapor locks, you've got battery usage. All you've got engine. The engine will fail on you if you let it, let the oil get too low. Nothing else like that exists in Microsoft Flight Simulator for a light aircraft right now. I think the the next uh, thing that's going to surpass this thing in terms of complexity and depth is going to be the the Aerosoft CRJ 700 airliner when that comes in in about a week's time, is it? Something like that. Um, fairly soon, anyway. But you know, a light aircraft and an airliner are two very different things. Um, if you're after an airliner, then there's really nothing to touch this thing, in my opinion, in terms of just the the amount of depth. Um, that it has, and like all the circuit breakers operate, and, and it's just so good. Um, and moreover, everything works as it should do. It's the, there were no sort of weird bugs like um, the gauges working the wrong way around and things like that, like the the Carinado Seminole had when I reviewed that. Um, the ADF not parking on the right wing when you go to antenna mode is really the only thing I could pick up as being not quite right. When I read in the documentation, it does describe that that's how it should operate. So presumably, it's a bug and it will be fixed. So fingers crossed. Um, included documentation is the next item I've got. Uh, basically, they give you almost a f half a, a POH in terms of the, the amount of documentation that they include with this aeroplane. I'll just put some of them on the screen now as I'm talking. Um, all the performance graphs are there. It's really, really um, in-depth, and you can see for yourself in various different temperature and weather conditions, uh, power settings, weights, all the rest of it. And you can see how close the aeroplane can get to the real-world book figures, um, which is just bang on, really. Um, it's really nice of them to do it. It's almost like, like I said earlier, it's almost like they're daring you to, to check the book figures and then fly the aeroplane and see if it matches up to them. So why not go out and do it? Um, liveries? I uh, showed you a little bit earlier. There's a lot of liveries that come with these aeroplanes. They're all based on real aeroplanes. This livery is uh, particularly good for me because I've flown the real one. Um, so yeah, uh, number of, great number of liveries, all very faithfully reproduced with lots of sort of real world dirt and, and grime and little bits of wear here and there to, to make it look like a real aeroplane. Um, so top effort on that. Love it. Um, I also think, in my opinion, it's pretty good value. Um, certainly if you, you have this aeroplane for other simulators and you can get a discount, it's unbelievable value because it's actually about sort of four pounds cheaper than what the Carinado Seminole 
is. And in my opinion, this has a lot more functionality than that does. So you're getting a lot more for your money, in my opinion. Okay, so negatives. Um, there are some. I know I've been kind of singing its praises for the last five minutes, but I do have some downsides to it. Um, the texturing on the outside and the inside in places is a bit fuzzy. I showed you in the hangar some places where uh, it is not quite as nice, certainly as the default aeroplanes and the Carinado aeroplanes. It doesn't mean it's bad, it just means it doesn't stand up to the, the sort of gold standard that Microsoft Flight Simulator has set with those aeroplanes. Um, the Certainly if you compare it to P3D add-ons and things like that, it is far and away better than all of them. Um, apart from perhaps like the PMDG aircraft and, and some of the Aerosoft aircraft and things like that. Um, and the FS Labs Airbus, I guess. But in terms of um, your, your GA aircraft, I, I think you'd be very, very hard pressed to find something better in, in other simulators. It's just that Microsoft Flight Simulator has set such a high standard when it comes to visuals. Um, there's also, you know, the little bits inside, like like overhead, they could do on maybe making this look a little bit more uh, refined. Other than that, it's great. But yeah, there's a few downsides on that. So if you're if you're a real magpie for the shinies, maybe that's going to put you off this aeroplane. Um, now, we used the autopilot a little bit earlier, and you notice that when I did one of those touch and goes, it kind of did a bit of a dramatic right roll. Now, I think that is like a weird carryover from the autopilot. If you use the autopilot and then you turn it off either with a, a bind on your yoke or your joystick or you use the switch, it tends to keep trying to roll the aeroplane one way or the other, which is just quite annoying really and it does eventually go away after you've kind of wiggled the controls about a bit um, but it can do weird things to your aeroplane as it did to us uh, on the ground uh, a second ago so the autopilot is not quite there I mean I, I massively admire them for putting such a great um, implementation of, of what most real world arrows have in terms of an autopilot it's a rubbish autopilot in the real world and I suppose um, it's sticking to the realism here because it's a uh, rubbish autopilot in the, in the sim too. Uh, it will follow a heading. I would not trust it to, to go into nav mode or anything like that. I, I don't know what the altitude holding mode is like. It has like a cheat altitude holding mode. I've not tried it because it kind of breaks the immersion because the real one doesn't have an altitude holding mode. Uh, but yeah, if, if you're after an aeroplane with a lot of automation, this is certainly not it. It's a hand-flying aeroplane. So don't be under the impression that you can just whack the autopilot on and fall asleep. It uh, requires a hand on the controls really all the time. Uh, certainly until maybe they'll they'll add a bit more um, fidelity to that autopilot and it'll it'll be a little bit better. But I mean, the number of times in a real arrow I've turned the autopilot on and it's tried to barrel roll me in, into a, a death spiral. <laughs> I mean, it, it it pretty much is is what happens most of the time to be honest. So, like I said, it's almost like a, an extra realism feature. Um, the GPS 100, fantastic that they've, uh, that they've included it, sorry, looks great, but it's quite limited in its functionality. I would really like them to add a bit more function to that thing so we can kind of muddle our way through using it and learn how to, to put, uh, put waypoints in, do direct twos, um, all sorts of things like that. There's a message function that's supposed to be able to show you when you're coming up to airspace and all kind of stuff like that. So it'd be great certainly because there's not that many really old-fashioned GPS units modelled in flight simulators. Um, so it'd be nice to see that one uh, come in and, and get more functionality as the time goes on and we can sort of leave behind the uh, the default flight simulator GPSs. If, if, of course, you want to. I mean, like I said, the default GPSs are getting better. I complained last time that there's no sort of put your your uh, your airfield in press enter enter it now does that so they are getting better bit by bit maybe there's a, there'll be an obs function soon if we keep complaining about it um so yeah nothing wrong with the default gps they are getting better and better over time but it would be nice to see since we've finally got a a, a functional semi-functional custom made gps some more function come to that so we can actually use it um to navigate around and, and put waypoints in and stuff like that the final point I've got is that the, the ground handling sometimes feels a little bit weird. Um, if you leave it at 1200 RPM and pop the parking brake off, it kind of shoots forward a little bit more quickly than you'd expect with the real aircraft. And the rudder seems a little bit oversensitive. And the real aeroplane, the rudder is very heavy on the ground. So I'd expect a little bit more inertia in the, the way it controls. Um, low airspeeds, I, I think... 
I, I, at first I thought the rudder was a bit oversensitive in the air as well, but I think that was probably just the way I had my rudder pedal set up. I've kind of dropped the sensitivity a bit now. And they um, they do control the aeroplane a lot nicer, a lot more smoothly now. So I'm not going to pull it up in the air for that, but on the ground I will say maybe a little bit more inertia to go into the model just to make to add that extra tiny bit of uh, realism, given that they've done such an amazing job with how it handles in the air. So that's it really. I guess it's time to, to draw a conclusion. So you can probably guess that I'm going to come to a pretty positive conclusion about this aeroplane. Um, I think, personally, that it is absolutely worth 30 quid. And if you had this aircraft for any other flight simulator, and it's only £20 for you, or £21, or whatever, it's £22, then absolutely get it. Because for less money than a Carinado aeroplane, you're getting something with so much more functionality than the Carinado aeroplanes. With such a, a, a better flight model, such a more faithful flight model, if you are after a true representation of what a real aeroplane is like in Microsoft Flight Simulator, I would be very, very hard pressed to get a bit loud out here to recommend anything else to you. Um, I, I absolutely think this is the the gold standard right now. There are areas of improvement, sure, but you know this is Microsoft Flight Simulator and bugs are far for the course, so we should be uh, kind of used to to there being little bits of room to improve and I'm sure it will improve. Uh, the amount of time and effort they've taken to make this thing, they are no doubt going to keep working on it and keep ironing out the little niggles that there are. So I certainly think it's worth it, um, with a discount or without a discount. But that's just my opinion. I'm sure uh, you might have a, another opinion, and I'm sure you're going to tell me in the comments how wrong and stupid I am. Um, <laughs> that said, uh, if you enjoyed the video, if you enjoyed the, uh, the breakdown of, the, of this aeroplane that I've done for this, please leave a like um, or a subscription maybe. If you, you like what we're doing with the channel, it really does help us out uh, and motivate us to keep going and making more. Thank you for watching if you've made it all the way through, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Goodbye.